Well, good afternoon everybody. I want to thank uh, uh, the Pakistan Society of Nephrology, especially Dr. Uh, uh, Nisa Anwar and uh, the organizing committee for inviting me to present uh, the seminar. Uh, I have two talks. Uh, let me start with the first one today. The tomorrow one is going to be more on related to kidney disease. The one that I want to tell you is about the microbiome and dysbiosis in health, disease, as well as uh, the healing processes. Uh, just want to give you a sort of disclosure that uh, you know uh, I am one of the key founders of uh, Kibo Biotech. I continue to be employed at uh, Kibo, and uh, I do have a substantial interest in the, uh, in the equity of the company. And in addition to that, I always take pride in telling that uh, my roots are originally from India, and uh, that's why I had the problem of getting the visa, and uh, fruits are from USA. So, I would like to just give you some sort of an idea that in, in just last year, in October, the Cleveland Society normally meets uh, every October, and they decide what are the upcoming technologies for the next, uh, next year. And they put all these 10 technologies, as you can see here, from top to bottom, and you get bioabsorption instead. But the number one is the gut microbiome. So, using the microbiome to prevent, diagnose, and treat disease was the main topic. So, I thought this is more appropriate to give you some idea on this particular one. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't know anything about, uh, you know, the, what is the number of cells and all of it that we have. In 1990, we started for, to find out how many number of cells are in our whole body. And uh, in 2013, we found out that there are 10 trillion cells, 10 trillion cells we have, and there are about 23,000 genes in our body. This is called the Human Genome Project. But my well, this is only for the whole body. One thing is, everybody forgot about the most important one, that is the bowel. About three to four pounds of the materials that we have in the bowel is called as gut microbiota or gut microbiome. And the number of cells that is present in the gut is 100 trillion. I'm just telling you 100 trillion. And the number of genes that is present is we have 3.3 million genes, I should say. So this was actually done in phase one as well as a phase two. And by taking samples from various parts of the body, and uh, over 1300 reference strains have been isolated from human body, and they've been sequenced, and this is still going on. So, just to give you an idea, why did the human genome take, you know, 13 years and how come our gut microbiome, which is much more complex, took only about 5 years and if you see the cost, this was $3 million, whereas we did the whole gut microbiome for about $200 million and 23,000 genes was 3.3 million genes. So, really, you know, we have come to a point to realize that we are in a position to even sequence the whole genome for less than $500 today. And there is a company trying to do it in about $100 a chip. Well, if you take the, 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 the modern cell phone, you can see this, the modern cell phone can do everything that you want to wish in a control. So, the advances that has happened in this, in this technology, eh, what we call as the computational technology, has transformed into biology. This is what we call as bioinformatics. Previously, it will take about 10 days or 12 days or 15 days to sequence one genome, as you said. Now, you can do in one hour 10 genomes, as you said. So this is possible because of the advances that has been taken place that has transformed from that of uh, cell phone technology or what we call as uh, digital technology to what we have now. So if you take the whole body and take the gut out, we just have found out that the gut, about 
three to four pounds of the gut material has got 100 trillion cells and 3.3 million genes. As a matter of fact, until 2004, everybody forgot there is a gut and there is a bowel issues, you know. We know about liver, we know about kidney, we know about brain, we know about breast, but nobody thought bowel is an organ. It was only 2004, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences published its first paper indicating that the microbiome can be viewed as a metabolic organ totally tuned to our physiology that performs function we have not had to evolve on our own. So this is the year we recognize bone as an important organ. And of course, you see all this viral of reaction there. Are, probably if you count it, there will be about 3 to 4 thousand reactions are there. But do you know, all this reaction that you see is responsible because of the 100 trillion cells that we have besides the 10 trillion cells in the whole body, as you say. So this gut microbiome is very crucial, very important, and this is how we are learning day by day. Every day you see something, they will always say about gut microbiome and health. And we distinctly know, we just published in 2012 a paper uh, about probiotic, prebiotic, gut and beyond, as you say. We actually thought right at that time, almost all sorts of diseases are associated because of the imbalance of the gut microbiome which is actually becoming true now. If you go to anywhere, you will be able to see that almost all diseases are associated with the imbalance or what we call as dysbiosis, the good bacteria versus the bad bacteria in the bowel. So this imbalance actually, you know, causes even obesity. You know, obesity is because of the imbalance of the gut microbiome. From obesity, of course, you know, you get insulin resistance, and if you insulin resistance, you get pre-diabetes, free pre-diabetes, you get diabetic disease. From diabetic disease, you come across all sorts of uh, atherosclerosis, hypertension, retinopathy, all sorts of diseases eventually ending up in death. So, gut microbiome is very crucial and very essential, and at this point, I want to digress and give you some idea about probiotics. Well, probiotics are live microorganisms and they do several things. They do the modulation or immunomodulation and these are the things that they do in the bowel. Continuous con control of inflammatory bowel disease, the strengthening of innate immune system, the alleviation of food allergy, etc. And it also normalizes the intestinal microbiota and metabolic effect, control of uh, irritable bowel syndrome, suppression of endotoxins or pathogens, and exogenous pathways or travelers' diarrhea. And of course, the most important is there are a lot of metabolic effects, lowering of serum cholesterol, improvement of lactose tolerance, or reduction of uh, reduced risk of colon cancer. All this is because of the, the, the tremendous amount of biochemical reaction that is happening in, in the gut. To tell you the whole thing, the probiotics are nomenclature classified into what we call as genus, species, as well as strain. And uh, genus, we are all homo sapiens or homos. And, you know, species, of course, here, we, you know, I'm a medical researcher. Of course, Dr. Anwar Nizar Anwar is, is a nephrologist. So, our family is in the research family, you, his family is the clinical research family. But then, the strain is very important, I should say. Well, there are only very few fantastic nephrologists like Dr. Nizar Arwa. And uh, I don't say I'm so fantastic, but I'm the only one we are involved in the area of gut microbiome, which has been doing for a long time. So distinctly, only those strains that has a health benefit is termed as probiotic. So not all, only those which has got a health benefit as termed as probiotics. I want to tell you uh, another thing. We know about probiotics. Now we are telling about prebiotics or what we call as the fibers. These are all the foods that we have, what we call as the fiber that is present. Again, as I told you about in the case of probiotics, in the case of prebiotics, there are only certain fibers which are called as prebiotics and these are present mainly as carbohydrates, 5 to 10 monomeric units and 
they are complex uh, products like inulin, fructooligosaccharide, galactooligosaccharide, etc. And they are normally present raw oats uh, and refined barley wheat. And a combination of pro and prebiotics is called as symbiotics. So normally you come across a combination of this in any form of the products that you see and uh, you would be in a position to see. If you take a gut microbiome imbalance, as I told you, there are 3.3 million genes that are there. And if you take in the normal healthy situation, we have more of a beneficial bacteria than the hormone one. So the beneficial bacteria actually controls the gut permeability, toxemia, pro-inflammation, as well as it increases insulin sensitivity, as well as the gut metabolic, as well as cardiovascular. Yeah, this is what a good, a good healthy person does. Whereas, when this permeability, when this is imbalanced, or when there is a dysbiosis, when there is an imbalance of more of the pathogenic bacteria than the good bacteria, we call it dysbiosis. When the dysbiosis happens, the hormonal opportunity pathogens are number greater than the beneficial bacteria. So this increases gut permeability, endotoxemia, systematic inflammation, insulin resistance, as well as adiposity, diabetes, whatsoever diseases you call. So now we know almost all diseases occur as a result of imbalance of the gut microbiome and today these are all the products that is available on the market these are all probiotics as of now there is no probiotic drug because probiotics are manufactured only for the food grade or dietary supplement grade there is no company manufacturing with a drug master file so you will not see any probiotic product claiming to be a drug and therefore our product is also not a drug issue at this point, I want to digress and give you a little more about how important the gut microbiome is. A lot of times you come across uh, C. difficile infections and no antibiotic can cure it, as you say. When you come across these sort of, almost 10% of the hospital infection is because of C. difficile infection and most of the patients die. And in these cases, we have tried what is called as fecal microbial transplant or fecal transplant. And basically, it is a fecal bacteria is transplanted into the recipient through a stool infusion via colonoscopy, endoscopy, or simuloscopy, or enema. And uh, the history of this goes a long way, as you can just see this from 4th century, the Chinese literature. And uh, today, it is very successfully used actually. In, in people who are with C. difficile. So you come across the history of this and uh, recently there have been numerous publications reported the successful outcome of the FMT treatment, those with ulcerative colitis also. The clinical trials are also going on into the irritable bowel syndrome and other diseases and uh, uh, the, the fecal microbial transplant has proved to be very, very well received, especially under C. difficile infections. Actually, there is a company called as uh, Open Biome, which sells the product as a capsule. Basically, they take from a very healthy volunteers, screen all the things they want to, there is no contamination, infection, etc., and take the stool and stir it in saline and get the filtrate. The filtrate is actually put in a, in a freeze dryer and they put it in a capsule and at those stage of 24 to 36 capsules, they have reported 95% recovery in 3 to 5 days to normality. Those who fail the second time, they recovered absolutely full normality. So we have a very good idea about using the fecal microbial transplant and now let me get back again to the gut microbiome how the gut microbiome is related to the aging process or what we call as the healing process that is going to be the next topic of it. Now I'm going to tell you something about the aging process. All living things go through a growing phase, a stable phase, a degenerative phase. As a matter of fact, unless one dies of an accident, every one of us go through a degenerative phase of some sort of a disease 
before we depart from this world. Now, this process is really related to the entire gut microbiome. In the gut microbiome, I told you there are so many, you know, species and strains of bacteria that is present. So we call this group of them as what we call as a phyla. Now, if you take, you know, the young population, uh, the growth uh, phase versus what we call as the degenerative phase, in the growth phase, we come across a large amount of actinobacteria bacteria as well as bacteriocyte. These are the phylas that is present here. Whereas in the decaying phase, what we have is we have mostly uh, uh, ferrocytes as well as proteobacteria. So this is sort of heat map and this gives you a sort of uh, age related changes in microbiota composition as we age. This is common for almost all people and more so the changes that occur is if you can take a look at it it is the actual bacteria as the firmicides are much more in the younger generation or a growing phase whereas if you take the bacteriocytes as a proteobacteria it is more so as you can just see in the in the aging, aging phase or the degenerative phase so there is a growth curve and stable curve anterior to every phase of that is related to the changes in gut microbiota and this is what we call as not only individual ones it is grouped together and this the co-abandoning group is called as these groups if you take in the case of again the M in the growth phase you can distinctly see in the growth phase you have uh, much more of the bifidobacteria which compromises the active bacteria and of course you can see less of the bacteria size but at the same time you see in the young phase you have more of this uh, anterior bacteria so as we grow again you can see the bacteria size as well as the anterior bacteria increases so there is a, certainly a shift of the composition of the gut microbiota phylum as you just grow from the growth phase, cell phase, as well as degenerative phase and it is during the degenerative phase only you come across all the dysbiosis and all related disease problems that you just come across although this could happen during the stable phase also. In summary, everything that we do we never thought is going to be the case. Everything is happening because of the two to three pounds or four pounds of gut microbiome that we have. The changes in this is constantly happening. As a matter of fact, there is a book called as a gut-brain connection. Almost our brain activity is related to the gut. Similarly, gut-kidney connection, gut-liver connection, everything is related to the gut. So the imbalance of the gut microbiome is related to not only in the, during the early phases or it is also in the, the middle phases but also in degenerative phases so it is not only in health, disease, also the healing processes so when I say healing processes what do you mean by aging processes? everybody is going to age but we want to age gracefully we want to age without any illness we want to age healthy as you say so what we call as healthy aging is the process of aging how can you do a healthy aging, as you say? Healthy aging can be done having, observing a good diet and exercise, very key, important, doesn't matter. Any sort of disease, anything, you, is that depend upon the circulation of blood and it is very key, important that you always have some sort of an exercise, a physical activity. And of course, the gut microbiome is dependent upon the various active factors and we come across senescent cells, senescent cells, you know, there is still a lot of controversy going on. Uh, they don't reproduce, but at the same time, they produce various telomeres, which is sometimes, you know, the telomeres, long telomeres, they say is related to your lengthy life. But wherever there are too many of long telomeres, they will probably produce some of the toxic materials, which probably will lead to some of the diseases including cancer. There is a big debate going on that. So that's another new area that we can just take a look at it. But still, if you ask me, how do we age? We still don't know how we age. But aging is a process 
for any living things, whether it is a human being or a bird or a sheep or a tree, you are going to come across a growing process, stable process, degenerative process and what all we want is, we want to degenerate in a healthy way and that is why aging is not lost youth but a new stage of opportunity and strength and uh, so gut microbiome plays a very crucial part in health and disease as well as in the healing process. So with that I would be delighted to take any questions from you. Thank you very much and I look forward to delivering the other lecture tomorrow.